Let's stand and worship God together.
that she poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love.
is our God. Sing, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Lord, we come before you and we just, I pray that it's our heart's desire today that though we would come before you uh, just with a contrite spirit, a humble spirit, um, I, I just pray that um, you would allow us to see that you are the one true God, that you are, are the king of, of everything. You are the father of truth and, and you hate lies. Lord, I just, I just pray that you are revealed today in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I love the opportunity to, to preach uh, the Word of God, to speak the truth, uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, contrast to what David was uh, sharing with the kids today. There is so much to learn from that. There's so much to learn from whether we're being sincere and real from the inside of our lives. Telling the truth. It says uh, in the book of uh, Timothy, we started uh, 1 Timothy last week, and uh, somebody reminded me as they came to me this morning, and they said, I've already heard you preach this morning. I go, what? How did you do that? Were you in Sunday school? Because some of the people in Sunday school said I was preaching today. Um, but uh, they said, no, you know, I, I listened to it on the, online. And I go, oh, okay, it's cool. You know, you can, you can follow us uh, on the line on, on, on the website and, and just kind of track with where we've been. But last week, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and uh, the first uh, 17 uh, verses. And today we're going to pick it up from there. But the theme verse today is uh, found here in uh, 1 Timothy 2. <coughs> in, the, in the middle of this verse, uh, it's chapter 2 verse 7, it says, I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. And, and I like that. And Paul, Paul is saying, I'll just, I'm just going to hit straight. I'm going to tell you straight. I'm going to tell you the truth. Now, how many of you would really rather hear the truth than be lied to? Good. You come to the right place because I want to tell you the truth. Now, sometimes the truth is not popular. Did you know that? Sometimes the truth is not, you know, culturally accepted. You know, sometimes the, the truth is not politically correct. You know, sometimes the truth is, is just the truth. But the Bible says the truth sets us free. The truth changes lives. Matter of fact, Jesus was so confident in that that he said that he was the way and the truth and the life and that no one could get to God the Father in heaven except by going through him. So you cannot get to heaven without the truth. And so I want to tell you the truth, the truth so blatantly honest and real. I just want to, I want to keep it real with you. And Paul says it too to Timothy. Now, I like this, uh, this book. I, I remember I was named after Timothy. Timothy wasn't named after me, uh, just, so, just in case you, you need to know that. I, I, this guy's been around a long time. Paul wrote this letter to him. And Paul already had a great dialogue, a great relationship with Timothy. Matter of fact, Timothy probably already had heard the stuff in this book way before the letter was written. Paul already spent a lifetime investing in Timothy. And now he's getting close to the end of his life. These are the last couple letters that he writes in 1 and 2 Timothy. But in this letter, it's very personal. And he's, he's really communicating his heart to Timothy so that Timothy will be reminded and have credentials of, of, of what Paul wrote to him so he would know how to, how to, to really govern things in the church, how to, how to set things in order. If you remember, Paul had sent Timothy to the town called Ephesus. You ever heard of Ephesus before? You know, at the men's retreat, they kept going, E-P-H, 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 what's that, you know? And, and we realized that that was Ephesians, and, and there's a great book there that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Well, Paul had left Timothy in, in Ephesus and said, you know, I want you to be a pastor there. I want you to take care of this church. And, and, and Ephesus was so cool that later on, John, the beloved disciple, 20 years later, you know, he wrote a letter. Uh, back to the church in Ephesus because the Holy Spirit said you better stir that church up because the church goes through seasons. Do you know that? It's like us. We might go through times where we're really excited for God. How many of you have ever been really excited for God? Amen. Can you say amen? amen? 
Oh, good. How many of you have ever been not so excited for God? Can you say boo? Yeah, because that's not really, you don't really want to say amen to things like that. You know, those are the kind of things like, but we go through them. That's reality. And churches go through them. Sometimes churches are really excited. They get excited. They grow and they, 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 they reach out to the neighbors. They love each other. And, and then sometimes, you know what? They, they hurt each other's feelings. And sometimes they're, they're not as kind. Sometimes, and you, why do they do that? Well, because of sin in our lives. Because of the humanness side of us that we walk in instead of the spirit that God wants us to. Because when we walk in the spirit, guess what happens? When we walk in the spirit, we live in the spirit, then guess what? The, the, the God of all heaven comes and fills us with the spirit and we produce spiritual fruit. You know, which is good stuff. There's no law against that spiritual fruit. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. And we need that, and our relationships need that. Husbands and wives need that. Families need that. We need it as a church. We need a little more love, a little more joy, a little peace. And the only way we can do that is to let the Holy Spirit of God work in our lives and let the truth of God sink in and, and produce in us what he wants to produce. Well, Paul uh, writes to Timothy, he says, listen, I'm not exaggerating, I'm just telling you the truth, and I want to tell you the truth. And so today, we're going to get a little instruction. There's seven points, and you know, things for you to fill in the blanks on, but I want you to catch this as instruction from the Word of God. And you may say, well, wait a minute, I, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Well, guess what? You have your own Bible, you can open it up, you can read it, it's there. And I want to teach you how to correctly understand what Paul said to Timothy is good for the church. It's good for us. So let's open up to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and the very end of it. And we read in verse 18 and 19. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. Based on the prophetic words, Mr. Mr. Nate, are you alive? It's stuck. Okay, well, you guys got your Bibles? There it is. Okay, it unstuck. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battle. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep a clear conscience, but that's for the next point. So cling to your faith in Christ. I must cling to faith in Christ. This is part of my instructions. I'm telling you the truth. You've got to cling. What does it mean to cling? You know, sometimes you've heard of relationships, you know, maybe you've watched a chick flick or you watch something on movie and, and when this guy says, oh, you're too clingy. Well, that's an immature kind of communication in a dating relationship and they probably don't know the Lord. <laughs> but we as Christians need to cling to something. We need to cling to Christ and we need to cling to faith in Christ. That means we need to get so excited and so stuck that on what, who, who, and who and what Christ is that we trust him completely, explicitly for every single thing in our lives. And we, we just get glued, stuck, clinging to Christ. It's almost like last week, remember when I was holding on the, the little leash, you know, and I was walking off the edge and I had that big anchor solid behind me that wasn't going to move and I kept leaning and, and I can do it today because I don't have that. But I was clinging on. You didn't know that. I was clinging on to that little black leash as I was leaning off the stage, clinging and, and, and trusting completely that he wouldn't walk too far forward and me crash my face in the floor. But I was clinging on to that. That's what hope is. And when he says here, we cling to Christ. We cling to faith in Christ. Guys, you have to realize that you are in a battle. Did, did you read that in this verse? It says... You are in this spiritual battle, and you're learning how to fight the Lord's battle. Now, can you imagine if you went out there and you were fighting the Lord's battle, and you drew your sword, you know? And you went to swing, and you forgot to hold your hand on the sword. Has anybody ever done that in baseball? You know, you get up there, strike one, strike two, and you swing, and you swing with all your might in just perfect form. You know, I, I, I don't know what that is, but... Uh, maybe it's golfing, you know, you don't understand the base. But you get up there and, you know, you're, you're just doing it just right. And, you know, okay. and off the golf ball or club goes, and off the baseball bat goes, and hits the first baseman, not the ball, but the bat. And you go, that's not how you play the game. Well, if you were in a battle and you don't hold on to your sword, <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> yeah, you're going to die, people. In this thing here, if you let go of faith, if you don't hang on to faith, the Bible tells us, in, in other words, it says we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we also have the shield of faith. 
You say, well, I threw away my sword. You better hang on to your shield and cling to it. If you don't cling to your shield of faith, you are dead. My friends, this is what he's saying. I must do this. I have to realize. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on your faith. You're going to go through testing of your faith. Do you know what testing your faith is? It's trials. It's difficulties. It's problems. How many people have ever had a problem? You're honest? How many people have never had a problem? Okay, see, these are testing of our faith. We all go through them. We cling to faith in Christ. And when you do it, I tell you the truth, when you, when you do it, you cling to your faith in Christ, he'll help you. The next point is what else do we need to do? Keeping it real. We must keep our conscience clear. Listen to this. He says, and keep your conscience clear for some people have deliberately violated their consciences. And as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. You know what I mean? It says you got to have faith. you got to cling to your faith in Christ. And then you got to keep a clear conscience because you say, well, I'm, I'm holding on to my sword. I'm holding on to my shield. But then you don't have a clear conscience. And guess what? Your shield and your sword just, just vanish away from you. you, 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 you you're defenseless in this battle. And some people have deliberately violated their consciences. Now, how do, how do you deliberately violate your conscience? Do you know? You know, your, your, your conscience. And the Bible says, this is a, a time where it says that you shouldn't violate your conscience, but it doesn't ever say, let your conscience be your guide, because sometimes consciences can, can be really, really skewed. Sometimes they're really wrong, because the Bible says our conscience can be warped, they can be, they can be seared, they, they, you know, because sometimes we've been doing the wrong thing way too long, and all of a sudden they're warped. We don't, we don't have, so we have to have clear instruction to have a, a right sense, but, but when you have a right sense, and the Word of God is teaching you straight, and you believing straight, and then you come out there and you say, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's violating your conscience. I know I shouldn't do this. This is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. There's several illustrations in Scripture, uh, like Ananias and Sapphira. If you, that'll just jog some memory for some of you. Uh, uh, like Achan in the Old Testament. Does that maybe draw, draw some attention to some of you? There's a lot of people in the Scriptures who violated their consciences. Like, uh, remember the guy, uh, the, the servant? Uh, David. Yeah, David violated his conscience. Yeah, like when he committed adultery and then when he murdered somebody and when he hid it. And I mean, and, and I, you know, Elisha's servant, Gehazi, remember when he went to steal all that money and say, hey, please. And then he got leprosy. If you were in Bible study, you heard that one. A lot of people violate their conscience and it wrecks them. It wrecks them for life. I must keep my conscience clear. That's telling you the truth. And then it says in the next one here, I must... Begin to pray. Um, I, 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 let's go back here. I, I didn't mean to jump ahead. I re missed reading half the verse, and it's very important because you have to understand what he said. I must uh, keep my conscience clear. Some people have deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. And he gives us two examples. He says, like Hymenius and Alexander. Now, how many people know too much about Hymenius? Anybody know any, any much about Hymenius? How about Alexander? Okay. Well, Hymenius. Hymenius and Alexander in this verse are two examples that, that Paul said, I had to throw them out of the church. You say, wow, Paul, that doesn't seem very nice. That doesn't seem very sweet. You threw them out of the church. Why did he have to throw them out of the church? I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so that we not learn to blaspheme God. Here's guys who deliberately violated their conscience. They deliberately did the wrong thing. They knew it was wrong. They did it anyway, and they were unwilling to repent. No, the Bible says you should speak to people and cause them, help them to, to repent, help them to come to their senses, help them to turn away from the sin. But these people had, had gone so violently away from the truth, they weren't going to listen to Paul. And Paul had no other recourse after all the other the ch choices that he's made. He finally said, I have to throw him out of the church. I said, you have to go out. And he says, I'm going to just give you over to Satan. Interesting thing. Doesn't happen very often. But when Paul turned these two guys over to Satan, why did he do it? He says, so that they would learn not to blaspheme God. It's part of church discipline. It's part of correction. Some people just get mad at God and want to do their own thing. And so you have to say, okay, then fine. We'll just let you go out there in the world and experience the judgment 
that God wants to give and will let Satan deal with you. Now, when Paul did that with his apostolic authority, these two guys had different responses. We know for sure that the first guy, Hymenius, who is quoted in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he wrote to Timothy a couple of years later and he says, Hymenius is still slandering God. He's still going off the deep end. As a matter of fact, he's got another guy, and then he tells you the next guy in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, who went with him. It wasn't Alexander. Another guy went with him and was still causing turmoil in the church. Keep your conscience clear or you will go off the deep end and God wants you to have a faith that is strong. Next part. What I must do? I must, I must pray. I must pray for others. I urge you, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1, I urge you, first of all, pray for all people and ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings. And we don't have kings in the United States, but we certainly have presidents and governors and people that are over us. Pray in this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful, quiet lives Marked by godliness and dignity. So what must I do? I got to cling to faith. And I got to keep my conscience clear. And I must pray for others. You know what? Too much of, uh, of our culture and us and our prayers are all about me. And mine. And I. Dear God, I need this because I want this because I don't have this and I need this. And could you take care of me because of my... And what does the Lord's Prayer say? Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? It says, give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I mean, and there's probably more in there. But, but the, the concept is this. I don't know. Chris is not here. She would have quoted me on every single thing, made sure I was right. The, the point is this. God never intended us to pray selfishly. And, and Paul says, if you're going to be a, a godly person and, and you're going to stand strong, you've got to cling to faith. Yes, that's you. You've got to keep your conscience clear. You can't keep somebody else's conscience clear. You keep yours. But you individually are responsible to pray. Somebody say, well, I thought that was the preacher's job to pray. Isn't that the ladies' circle? Don't they get together? Ladies' prayer time? I mean, the elders? The, yes, the elders do pray. We meet every, every uh, Wednesday morning about 6.45 in the morning. And uh, some of the guys are like saying, man, that's kind of late. And other guys are saying, there's the 6.45 in the morning. You know, I mean, but we spend time and we pray for, for people. We pray for their needs. And, and, and we encourage you. Last year, um, Sharon Lapham had, was here and helped us uh, organize. We organized a, an all-church day of fasting and prayer. And we prayed right here. For our country, our nation, our leaders. I mean, we had more prayers going up all day long. People were coming and going all day long. And sometimes people will organize, will go and pray at abortion clinics. You can pray here or pray for that. You can pray for all kinds of things. Just don't be praying selfish. Pray for others. What do you do? That's what it says, intercede. You want what God to help other people. You know what's always neat is when you pray that God helps other people, he ends up helping you too. You know? If you end up just praying for yourself, nobody gets help. All right. Let's go on. I must pray for others. I must also understand the truth. Pray this way so that we can live peaceful, godly lives by godliness and dignity. This is good, it says, and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved. Isn't that amazing? Now, a lot of people take this verse and just becomes their life verse. I mean, it's great, because God wants everybody to be saved. I want everybody to be saved. Do you want everybody to be saved? What do we need if heaven was full? I mean, you know, what do we need if God says, oops, I redesigned heaven again because I didn't realize it was going to get so full. You know? I mean, I want everybody to be saved. I want everybody to know peace with God. And I'm just saying, hey, this is a selfish kind of little elite group. It's, it's only for a hundred and, you know, so, so many thousand. Hey, we don't do that. We want everybody. God wants everyone to be saved. But we know 
But not everybody's following God. Not everybody's listening to the message. Not everybody's going to even keep their conscience clear. It's good, pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved. And that's why we should pray for people. We should pray for others. We should pray that we can live in peace. We, can, we should pray that other people come to Christ. But there's only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. And that, who is that? That's Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. So he was completely human. He was completely God. The God-man, Christ Jesus, is the only one that can save people. So we should pray and say, God, we we're asking you, we're asking Jesus Christ to help speak through me, speak through the word, use the word, change people's lives. Lord, those people need to be saved. And before you witness to people, you pray for people. And, and, and you, you, you pray that God would give them open ears to hear. And then you pray that you would be willing to go. And then you begin to talk with people and you hope that people will be saved. Because there's only one, one way they're going to be saved, through the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way they're going to be saved through the way, the truth, and the life is if they hear. And how can they hear unless somebody goes? And so you are going to go. I'm going to go. We're going to tell somebody the good news, how they can be saved. But first, I have to understand it. I have to understand it. And, and, and he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. He says in the middle of all that, I want you to understand the truth. Now, just because it says that God wants everybody to be saved doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. Just because God says, I want all men to be saved doesn't mean that everybody goes to, goes to church is saved. Just because everybody lives in America isn't saved. You have to understand the truth in the midst of it all. What is the way to be saved? The way to be saved is clearly preached, and we've spoken on it numerous times. You must repent of your sin, trust God completely and fully, abandon yourself and say, God, I'm yours. If you do that, you've understood the truth. Now, let's go on. <clears throat> I must worship with holy hands. How many men or, or boys, how, how many males, would you raise your hand if you're men? If you're man, would you do that? Could you raise both hands? I, I know you had to put down your pens really, really hard. Yeah. Girls, you don't have your hands up right now because this is for the men, okay? This is a, now, this is really interesting because a lot of times, you can put them down now. A lot of times, the Bible is really generic. As a matter of fact, if you read it, it says brethren in the King James Version. That may mean brothers and sisters. It means just Christians. It means bro brothers. It really means brothers and sisters. I like the way the NLT translates most of the time when it comes through here and it says, instead of just brethren or brothers, it says brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. And when it says love each other, guess what it would say? When it said brothers love each other, it means brothers and sisters love each other. It means all of you Christians love each other. But then every so often, Paul gets really specific. And you know how we know he gets really specific? Because of the context of what he says. He gets really specific. And then he uses a different word and he begins to say, now this is for the guys and this is for the girls. Now how many women are here? Will you raise your hand if you're a woman? Just one hand's fine. It's okay. It's good. It's good. I don't want to you know, make you, you know, work too hard. Okay. You work hard all day long. You work willingly with your hands. I'm, I'm pleased as can be. I'm, I'm just going you to know that there's a difference in the scriptures between men and women. Well, I kind of knew that there's a difference between men and women. How many of you guys in here know the difference between a girl and a guy? Yes. You see, God made a plan here. And in the beginning, God created male and female. And there's this attraction that happens, and that's a natural thing that happens, you know, because it's a God thing. You've got to make sure that it's in the context of the Scriptures. But this passage now all of a sudden takes us, and Paul takes the, the church and, and Timothy specifically, he says, I, I want to talk about men for a minute. He says, I've been chosen, he says, Timothy, I've been chosen as a preacher, an apostle to teach the Gentiles. Now, th there were some Gen Jews, the people that they were God's chosen people in the Old Testament, and Peter went and preached to those. But Paul went to the Gentiles first, I mean, to the Jews first, and, and then they were stubborn. And so he said, forget it, I'm going to go just talk to the Gentiles. And he went to the Gentiles. He says, I've been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. Faith, cling to your faith. Keep a clear conscience. I'm telling you the, I'm telling you the truth. 
And in every place of worship, I want men to do this. No, whatever church he went to, whether it was Corinth, where it was Ephesus, or Thessalonica, or Philippi, he said to you Gentile guys, you men, I want you to become spiritual leaders. You men, I want you to take a stand for Jesus Christ And I want you to lead your homes and lead your families and do the right thing. You men, I want you to be an example. Now, this does not mean that women, you're not supposed to be an example too. But this calling the men to a righteous standard of leadership because chapter 3, which some of you miss next week, you have to listen to on the fly, is all about what it means to manage your family and manage your, 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 your ministry or your business or manage the church. We're going to talk about good management next week. And we're going to talk about the responsibilities of the men to be those kinds of godly managers. You young men here today, God is holding you accountable and responsible to grow up, to be pure, to be strong, to be leaders, to be godly men in our world, to be soldiers for Christ. And you older men... God is calling you to stay strong and to be men. And you oldest man, you're to be the examples of what you've been all your life. You're supposed to be leaders in the church. And so Paul is really specific. So this young guy named Timothy, he says, Timothy, in about two chapters, chapter four, he says, listen, don't even look down on because you're still young. Be an example. And, and I've always been young. You know, I just turned 55 last Sunday, but I'm still young. And you know what? I want to still be an example. And I want to call you to be examples. And that's why he says, now you men, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Now that's when you could say amen. You see, I want, do you want that? Do you want men to be free of anger or do you want men to run around angry all the time? I want men to be free from anger and really ready to serve God. I want men that, that have been, been freed from their past and freed from their addictions and freed from sin and freed from selfishness. I want men to be leaders who know how to follow. Men who are willing to say, I want to pick up my cross and follow Jesus and I want to worship him. And sometimes people say, well, I thought worship was for the girls. Worship's for the, for the women. Great, I love the women know how to worship. Matter of fact, the women probably can outdo most churches in worship. But that's why Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, encourage those men to be leaders. We have a wonderful women's ministry here. On break for one more week or two more weeks or something like that. We have an amazing men's ministry too. And we believe wholeheartedly that if the men would be the dad's And the husbands who love their wives and love the kids and train the kids and and live a a godly life will have a strong family and will have a strong church and our, our country will be changed for the good. And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God. What does it mean to have holy hands? That's a that's a that's a clinging to faith kind of thing. And that's a not violating your conscience kind of thing. That's saying, God, here I am. They're open. You know what? When you raise your hands, you know what, you know what I re- remember? It's surrender. If the policeman puts his gun at you and says, oh, put up your hands, you go, yes, sir, don't shoot. If God says, surrender, yes, Lord, I'll bow my knee if you want. And he says, I want you to do it with holy hands. How do we have holy hands? The only way we have holy hands is if we come before him and say, God, I'm a sinner. And we humbly ourselves, humble ourselves before God and says, God, I'm a sinner. I'm not even worthy, but I come to you, God. And, and, and here I am, just open and honest. And as men, if we do that, God is pleased. And that's true worship. I must worship with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Stop doing it my way. Start arguing about, you know, we do that too often. I, I've done that before too. You know, it's like we, we kind of too proud. We argue. We, we don't like to be confronted. You know, it's our pride that 
What does God call us to do? He calls us to deny ourselves and humble ourselves and pick up a cross and follow. And he calls that to the men to be that example. And so I'm preaching to the men. I must worship with holy hands. The next part, he talks about the girls. Guys, how many guys here? Raise your hands. Okay. How many have a finger? Take one finger, put it over here, and one finger, put it over here, and just say, I'm not listening, preacher. I can't hear when I do that. Okay, you don't have to do that, because you can listen, because this is good. But I'm going to talk to the women right now. Because this is good. I, I, I made the title fit so that it fits guys and girls both. But this is what Paul writes. He says, Timothy, now I want, I want to tell you, Timothy, I want women to be modest in their appearance. Do you know what that means? You know what the opposite of that is? Immodest in their appearance? We've all seen immodesty. Unfortunately, that seems to be a prevailing thing in our society. <clears throat> but it's nothing new. Immodesty has been there since the very beginning of time. And I want women, he says, to be modest in their appearance. Now, I, I put this in here. I must live what I claim. Because if you claim to be a godly woman, or if you're a guy, you claim to be a godly man, you better live it. This is what Paul says to the women. I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing. And now, guys, decent and appropriate clothing is great. It's good. It's not boring. It's not drab. It's bright and cheery and happy and, uh, and godly. Immodesty is a different thing. Immodesty is where too much skin is showing in too many places for the purpose of drawing the attention of other people to yourself. And there was more than that was happening in their day that people were doing things for the purpose of getting attention to themselves. And if you dress solely for the purpose of getting attention to yourself, it's Right or wrong? Wait, is it right or wrong? Okay, I'm glad you said it. I didn't have to say it. But I'm not afraid to say it. You should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Now, guys, there's nothing wrong with wearing gold. And there's nothing wrong if you got pearls. And there's nothing wrong with a necklace. And there's certainly nothing wrong with wearing clothes. Is good. Are you doing it so that people only see the outside of you? Then you're shallow. And that's not what God's called Christians to be. He didn't call us to be shallow. He called us to be deep. He called us to be reverent. He called us to be pure. You guys, if you only see the outside, then you just saw the fabulous box of wonderful things. And inside's the bag of lies. And the Bible says, man looks on the outward appearance and he goes, wow. But the Lord looks on the inside and he goes, yuck. And guys, you need to see what God sees and you need to be aware of what God's aware of and you need to come to Scripture the way God comes to Scripture and everything that looks pretty on the outside isn't necessarily pretty on the inside. What you get is a joy and a blessing is when the prettiness of the outside matches the prettiness of the inside. And then you got beauty. Because the woman who fears the Lord is going to be greatly praised. Now, women, I tell you, my dad said this. My dad's going to be here next week. Not only my sister, but my mom and my dad are going to be here. They're 81 years old. My mom's birthday next week. So if Rosemary's here, you can still say hi, Rosemary. Happy birthday. as Tim's mom. But, but you know... My dad always said, listen, and he's a preacher for years and years, and he says, listen, ladies, this is true. You know, it was way back in the day when, when some girls were saying, oh, makeup is wrong. You, you can't dress that way because that's sinful. And that's not what the Bible says. And my dad interpreted it well when he said, if the barn needs painting, paint it. <laughs> you know? That was a spir spiritual quote from my dad. But, 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 and you can ask him about it next week, you know. But you don't need to use all of the bucket of paint. All at one time. The point is, if you do what you do to just draw attention to yourself, that's what the scripture is saying. I'm just telling it. I'm just not exaggerating. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just telling the truth because that's what this message is about. I must live what I claim. 
Fix your hair, wear your gold, wear your pearls, but don't do it to draw attention to yourself. For women who claim to be devoted to God. This is why I put, I must live what I claim. Because it says, for women who claim to be devoted to God should be what? Devoted to God. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. Man, there's a lot of good and truth in all that. You know, just, you're just good people. You just do things. You serve. I mean, there's so many of you. I, I just I couldn't even pick out all the people here who serve the Lord, who do such wonderful good things. So many of you women who are just so greatly honored and, and to be praised because, I mean, if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have water to drink and, and, and uh, donuts to eat and chocolate donuts for some of you that are looking for them there. You know, I mean... <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't, you know, there's so many things. We, we might not even have clean bathrooms. I mean, James would be really busy if he had to do it all himself. I mean, I mean, we, we just, we, had, we thank you. I mean, the bulletins. You have a bulletin because some lady, you know, helped, you know, uh, edit it. And some other lady helped print it. And somebody else folded it. Yeah. I mean, you know, that wasn't even me. That, that's a, these women who are servants of God, who are faithful. Very beautiful. Very wonderful. And, and, and they're seen that way because... They're doing what God wants them to do. Guys, live what you claim. You men, live what you claim. Live a pure, pure life and a holy life and be an example. And then finally, Paul writes and he ends this passage. He says, I, 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 women, and this is, you know, I'm not trying to harp on you women twice in, in two slides, but I'm just keeping it real with the scriptures. How many of you like me to, to keep reading the scriptures? You know, some, some churches I've heard, you know, rip out certain parts. They don't like certain parts. We don't do that around here. So we kind of try and go right through it, you know, and kind of hit it all. Okay, so this is what Paul was teaching. He says, women should learn quietly and submissively. Wow, that's a good passage. Quietly and submissively. Matter of fact, Paul even said this. I don't let, I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Did you know that's why when this is setting us up, not, not to set you up, this is setting us up for next week. Do you know why next week is? Next week, chapter 3, if you read it ahead, you can. It's your Bible. It says first, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, one, it says, you elders, you're supposed to manage well the church. You deacons, you're supposed to serve well in the church. And guess what? It's setting up for what the men are responsible to do. And so he says here now, women, I don't, I don't let you teach and usurp authority over men. That's why all of the elders at Family Bible Church happen to be male. Because the Bible says it. Because God holds them responsible to manage their families, to manage their children, to love their wives, to be an example of what it means to be a man after God's heart. So women... Learn quietly and submissively. I don't let a woman teach her authority over man. Let them learn quietly. For God made Adam first. Now, if God would have said, hey, let's make Eve first, this whole story would have been flipped. But he didn't. And I'm not God. He made Adam first, and, and then guess what? I'm going to read the rest of this thing. I'll tell you about what Adam did. See, so for God made Adam first, and after we made Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived, and sin was the result, but women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. Wow, there's a whole mouthful there for us to ponder. We should live in faith. Oh, I think that was for everybody, guys and girls, right? Cling to faith. We should live in love. We, we talked about that last week. We got to have love. It was the goal of this whole letter. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And then we should live in holiness. I think that's what we said. Men, you ought to raise holy hands to God. And modesty. Women, you should live with modesty. When I look at this passage of Scripture, and it says that Adam was formed first and afterwards Eve, and she was, Adam wasn't deceived, but, but the, the woman was. But if you read this, the context in Genesis, you can go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and you can have this whole story all by yourself. You can well, just read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and it all makes sense. The serpent comes and tempts the lady, and she says, well, that does look good, and I think I will, and she takes it. And the Bible says to us that Adam was there watching. Now, why didn't Adam speak up? Adam was there watching. She takes the fruit. She eats it. Maybe says, oh, let's see how it goes with her. Hmm. 
And then she takes the fruit and says, hey, you want some, Adam? And Adam says, okay, honey, I will, and takes the fruit. And then when sin comes to them, immediately they feel guilt. The man feels guilt soon because he did it willingly and broke his conscience. He knew it was wrong. The, the woman was still deceived. You mean, you mean this was wrong? I thought it was, well, yeah, we really weren't supposed to do this. We better hide. We better cover ourselves up because we, we just got found out and they just found out that they were naked and they, and they felt ashamed and, the, and all of this thing happened right here. And then God comes walking into the garden. And when God walks into the garden, he says, hey, Adam, where are you? Not you, Adam, but man. He came and said, Adam, where are you? Wherefore art thou, Adam? And, and um, I'm over here, God. Where are you? Well, I'm just hiding over here, God. Why are you hiding? Did you eat from the, the forbidden fruit of the tree? It wasn't an apple, by the way. Did you eat from the forbidden fruit? It was not my fault. It's her fault. My friends, when God came walking, he didn't come to Eve and say, Eve, where are you? He came to the man and he said, man, you are responsible for what you were doing and your choices and your deliberate sinful rebellion. And my friends, God comes to the men of this church and the men of this country and they will always come to the men first and say, men, will you pick up the standard? Will you do the right thing? Will you raise your holy hands before me and serve me? And guess what, guys? If you don't, the women will. If you don't, the women will. A lot of times the women have to do stuff they weren't even created to do or designed to do or maybe even don't even want to do because the guys abdicate their uh, responsibilities. The dads are deadbeat. The dads are not faithful. The dads don't live the way God wants them to live. And God calls us to be different. So my friends, I'm just ask, asking you and challenging you. Goodness, I'm preaching a long time if that clock's right. Anyway, I, I, it's time for communion. I, I must live in God's word. My friends, I love you. First time I looked at the clock, we probably need to make it bigger now that I'm 55. <laughs> so if we have a scoreboard back there next week, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I got it. This is the word of God. It's the truth. I'm telling you. Let me pray for you. Father, help us to love your word. Help us to love your truth. Help us to understand how we are supposed to be for you. Help us to, to cling to what's right. Help us to be pure. Help us to be truthful. Lord, help us to, to be an example by living what we really claim. Help the men and the women here to realize and just rejoice in who you've called us and made us to be. Help us to understand who we're supposed to be and help us to find fulfillment in that. Help us to love you with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. And Lord, as we examine our lives right now and take this bread and this juice and think about our words and our actions and our thoughts, Lord, purify us. Use this, uh, this cup and this, this bread that we, that we take and pass around to remind us this first Sunday of the month what it means to put you first, to live for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, some of the ushers are going to come and pass this bread and this juice. And uh, if you would just prepare your heart right now, receive this. Think on the words of this song that Jill and I are going to share with you. Are my attitudes in accordance to your word? Is my thought life and my reactive words something to be
glorify me Is it the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the boastful pride of life that comes between you and me oh lord i must be clean search me oh god and know this bread and we drink this cup. 